So, a little bit of introduction, the structure of the presentation. I have two lectures uh, this week, I believe, Robbie, if I've got that correct. Yes, correct. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, this presentation will be split into two uh, halves. The first half will be an introduction, a brief history of mobile cranes, just for the kind of background knowledge more than anything else. The types of mobile cranes, configurations and components, and then planning factors. And then next time we, we meet, we'll go into a little bit more of how we plan the operate, uh, operation and understand the lift plans. So uh, I work for a company called Sarans. We are an international heavy lift company. Um, we do mobile cranes as well as SPMTs, which are self-propelled modular transports. Um, this is one of the many um, advertising slides, unwavering values. You'll get to know um, uh, you're kind of um, when you get into the business world, you'll understand that these uh, companies love these. So I put these in for um, a little bit of information. This was a video, but it's not going to work because the audio and it's not really that important. So I'm just going to skip that. Um, Sounds is an international company. We um, operate all over the world, nine geographical locations, 67 countries. And we have over 100 offices. Uh, the office I work out of is relatively small. Um, we have three people working out of here full time. Today, I'm the only one in the office because either people are in different countries or are working from home. So. Uh, in Sarans, we have our main sectors, which are oil and gas, mining, infrastructure, basically anything heavy that needs to be lifted or moved, we're probably in, uh, um, involved in some manner. Um, primarily at the moment, it's offshore wind we're doing a lot of work for, and infrastructure is quite a big one, uh, the one that I get involved with quite uh, probably the most. Um, as I've mentioned, we have uh, quite a big fleet of, of equipment. We have a big toy box that we use. Um, that we have the traditional cranes. We've got hydraulic and lattice booms cranes, which I'll go through this uh, this presentation and then tower cranes which I'll go through in a following presentation I believe next week no the week after sorry um, transport we have conventional trailers modular trailers and then we have the self-propelled and then we have a load of special equipment that uh, we design and um, uh, some of them are made in-house uh, some of them are uh, off the shelf stuff but we do special equipment like skidding and strand jacks um, and gantry systems so a very brief introductory to me because that's not really the point of this presentation. Um, my name is Andy. I've, I am a Loughborough University graduate. I graduated this basically last this year. Um, I'm a Sarans project engineer and I'm a technician member of the Institute of Engineering and Technology. I have a civil engineering de uh, high national degree and which is a HND and then uh, I have the construction management BSc, which I recently graduated. I've been in the industry about six or seven years at this point. Uh, I came into uni a bit late. I was a mature student when I joined, hence why I've got a bit more um, experience than the typical student. So on to what this presentation is actually about. And if I'm going too fast or anything like that, just feel free to shout. I'm happy to slow down. I just know that we've got quite a bit to go through. It's about uh, so I'm going to see how we go um, with this one hour slot. So by the end of this this presentation and the following one on uh, this week, we should I sh you should be able to understand the different types of mobile cranes, identify the components of mobile cranes, understand like crane configurations, at least ba in a basic manner, recognize common constraints inherent in crane operations and then read and under understand crane schemes. I'm not necessarily going to teach you the every single detail of how to from first principles do a crane plan because that's not necessarily what you're going to get involved with on a day to day um, uh, uh, on a day to day um, uh, routine because you'll you'll be construction managers most likely so you'll definitely get involved with mobile cranes at some point but it will be more in a feasibility uh, a kind of um, arrangement rather than a detailed lift plan. Uh, and again, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to ask. Yeah, any time, put your hand up, drop a message in chat, and then Robbie will read them out to me as uh, as they appear. Okay. So, 
just a brief history of mobile cranes. Nothing too detailed. We just uh, just kind of see so have a background knowledge. So very early mobile cranes were very dangerous, it, to put it lightly. They had no or very few safety systems inherent in them. You got manufacturer de uh, details saying you can lift this load at this radius, but the crane itself can't monitor that. It was up to the intuition and the, basically the feel of the operators. If they felt the crane was going, then they would uh, then they would um, uh, reduce the radius. As as you would think, accidents were quite common, and they were quite simple pieces of kit originally. Like, um, I'll just quickly see that one. That oh, laser pointer. Can you see that, Robbie? Uh, I'd say um, I'll. Sorry, can, you see the laser can you see the laser pointer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. That's perfect then. I just accidentally closed my notes. So, the, as you can see, they're quite simple pieces of uh, kit. There, a couple of lines, a hook, a boom. No, no additional stability. Just a pair, uh, just a set of wheels, and as you can see, very little safety equipment back in those days. So. Uh, is that? Yeah, sorry. So this is adapted by uh, from um, uh, a construction equipment guide. It was um, the first 50 years in, uh, of uh, cranes in America. It's quite a useful little little primer on where mobile cranes came from. So the original ones were rail based. Um, they they looked in a similar sort of vein to this. Again, quite simple. Uh, a lattice boom, a hook, a little bit of counterweight located on uh, rails. You can see a couple of these working on a construction site and then they would just set some rails up and they would just wander back and forth on site doing as they needed. Um, wheeled, one, uh, wheeled mobile cranes were introduced in about the 1940s, sorry, 1914s, sorry. And as usual, war kind of developed the uh, these um, uh, the early uh, war prompted a lot of development in cranes to cope with the adverse um, conditions in on in the in the field essentially. So, truck-based cranes were spurred by the need for quick repositioning on, uh, in supply depots, and crawler-based cranes were developed to tackle with adverse conditions. It's as you needed the cranes were developed. Um, <clears throat> the 1920s saw quite a big change uh, from moving from steam to internal combustion, along with similar to uh, cars. They kind of developed in parallel. But the way that those cranes were operated originally, it was like all, all of the force of the load being lifted would be almost put back onto the driver, driver's control. So they were very heavy. It was quite a quite a fatiguing job to have because you had to manipulate all these different levers and it wasn't until air clutches and hydraulic clutches were introduced where they became a little bit um, less strenuous to use basically it would be the same of um, driving a car with and without power steering would be the best way of um, kind of showing that um, outriggers were introduced in the mid 1900s as you can see here this one's just kind of got a, a beam and it's just blocked out with some bits of timber and that's adding additional stability. Not even the wheels are blocked out. It's very simple sort of uh, equipment back then. And then World War II, again, another war developed idea of hydraulic actuation booms. So this one was one of the first, I think they called it uh, the anteater or something like that due to this. So very simple um, crane compared to what we've got nowadays. And talking about nowadays, we have the more modern uh, mobile cranes, as you can see here. They are no longer operated by field. They are very complex pieces of equipment. They've got lots of electronically controlled and monitored safety systems. And the capacities are far and away much higher than they used to be. And they still continuously increase as well. Um, due to the increased safety, accidents are less common, but 
because of the weights we're dealing with, they tend to be more dangerous when they do occur. Um, so therefore, effective and complete planning of crane operations is essential um, for the safe use of these pieces of equipment. So that's just a very brief primer for where cranes came from. I thought it would be might be useful to kind of give you a little bit of background. It's nice to have, not essential, but the next bits are what you'll um, probably come across in your day to days. So we're going to go into the when, we, when, my, when I say mobile crane, that's actually kind of a catch-all term for a number of types of cranes. And these cranes being all-terrain cranes, which are probably the most common in the UK. The lattice boom crawler cranes, which again, are quite common in the UK. Telescopic crawler cranes, which are not as common, but you'll definitely see them on site. Self-erecting mobile tower cranes, which are uh, again, becoming more popular in the UK. Lattice boom truck cranes, we run a few in Sarans. They're not as common, but uh, there are a couple running around. Telescopic truck mounts, which are, again, not massively common in the UK, but they are slowly getting more and more common as the days go through. Rough terrains and then pick and carries, which are kind of pick and, car uh, pick and carries are more for an industrial in environment and um rough uh and pick and carry and sorry rough trains are very popular in the um i think they're very popular in the they used to be very popular in italy and very popular in the arab emirates and us and not so much in the uk but we'll get into that like i said the top five are the most common you'll come across in your day-to-day -day, uh, working on site um they're almost in um, ascending uh, order, so to from least to most uh, um, likely to encounter. But again, we'll go through the individual types. So this is the typical all-terrain crane. They range in size from quite small, in, in, in air quotes, quite small to much, much bigger. So these cranes have uh, a telescopic main boom, which is either hydraulic, either done by hydraulics or it's a rope pull, which means they got a ro uh, they got wires within it and they pull the individual sections out. Not necessarily need to know that, but that's the best way of identifying an all-terrain is basically by its look. They look very similar, um, even between manufacturers, they have this kind of size they're very popular in the uk they've got a high level of mobility they're able to drive on public roads um, albeit they are limited in their speed because they're defined as engineering equipment so um, but they are allowed on the public roads and they are um, very much um, uh, able to cope with more adverse um, site conditions Depending on the configuration you uh, uh, you define, so if they're using just their main boom, or if they've got a small additional uh, uh, like fly jib or something like that, which is something we'll come on to in the next section of this presentation, they the, they have the, the mobilization time, so the setup times is pretty low. For example, this sort of crane can set up in about um, if needs be half an hour to an hour, uh, depending on what it's running with in terms of its counterweight, it's, um, it's ho the hook block that's needed, whether it's needing any additional boom accessories, stuff like that. Um, they are incredibly versatile pieces of equipment, these uh, ones are, because they've got loads of different accessories that can be used with them to increase either their capacity, their range, um, their height, you, you name it, they, can, they are very, very versatile. Capacities with these types of cranes can range from about five ton to 1,200 ton. And, uh, but the issue is then when you get into the higher capacity ranges that any, basically anything bigger than this, which I believe is an L, uh, a 500 ton class mobile crane, the, the weight per, because in the UK, 
a lot of construction equipment uh, is limited on the roads depending on what pressure they're putting in through their tires and there are some requirements to be able to transport um, cranes by road is to have components taken off so some of the higher capacity all-terrain cranes need to be traveled without the boom because of that restriction but those the minority um, it's unlikely particularly you'll come across those that often um, a couple of photos of um, uh, just to dict uh, just show um, what I was on about in terms of them being incredibly versatile so we have quite a small mobile crane here doing some very simple work of just lifting some um, uh, I think it's grain styler components just moving everything around, just main boom only. Um, we have this one, which is, I believe, a 600 ton class that has been fitted with a luffing fly jib for longer reaches, uh, reaches over the building. And then we have here, we have two all-terrain cranes with uh, Y guys, which are or backstays, depending on who you talk to. They're called slightly different things, but they're the same piece of equipment. They basically just uh, provide additional capacity in their tandem lifting this uh, crane over into this site. Um, so there are a lot of lot of configurations to adjust the site requirements in terms of all terrain cranes. Moving into heavier pieces of equipment, um, we have um, crawler cranes. I'm going to start speeding up a bit because I just realized uh, realized it's been 17 minutes and I need to move along a bit. Uh, transporting, these are transported to site by truck, basically. These will come individually. So the crawlers will come on a different piece, uh, a different uh, truck. The counterweight will come on a different piece of truck. The individual pieces of the boom and the back uh, backstay, all of these pieces will come by truck because these are incredibly big pieces of equipment and they are not legal to drive on public roads for obvious reasons. Um, they are suited for lifting the heaviest loads that you will come across with these sorts of cranes. They are, again, incredibly um, versatile in their use. Uh, they've got loads of components. Um, they can track or travel with a load attached, with, usually with very little um, deductions to the capacities if you're tracking with a load. And so, the general capacities range from about 50 tons to about 3,200 tons in that sort of range. But trains getting bigger all the time. So it, I'm sure there, I think recently there's been a 4,000 ton crawler, uh, uh, crawler crane that's been developed by a, a Chinese company recently as well. So uh, the manufacturers are always pushing them higher and higher as the needs of the industry become higher and higher. So they're big pieces of equipment. Um, they're incredibly big. Um, this is a picture of me on site from uh, ooh, about a month ago. As you can see, I'm I'm five eight, and you can it gives you a kind of scale of how big these pieces these equipments can be. I, um, they are incredibly common in wind turbine erections and ports. Um, this particular one has got a widening, widened boom on, which is called a super boom, which further increases capacities. Um, and they are incredibly useful in adverse situations such as uh, this. I believe this is Russia, where we had a project in Russia uh, for some modules. Moving on, we've got some the smaller brothers of the of the crawler cranes we've got the telescopic crawler crane it's basically the same sort of gist but it's got a telescopic boom instead of a uh, uh, a lattice boom the it can track with a load again it has reduced capacities due to the hydraulic boom um, it has ranges from 16 to 220 tons and it can self-rig and support uh, itself so basically it can install its own um, crawler cranes. It, they're quite self-sufficient. There is a video that I will be um, providing to uh, Robbie in order to put up on Learn. That will be um, quite a quite an interesting watch if you're interested in how these get put together. 
Um, these are quite good workhorses if they need to be on site for a long time. They're quite good at uh, supporting like piling works and stuff like that because they're able to um, move around site on adverse conditions and they don't need to do re-rig with, um, they don't need to de-rig and then re-rig as they go. They can trans, uh, they can track themselves as they stand so they can be completely configured and then just wander around site doing uh, whatever they want. Um, out of curiosity, does anyone or would anyone be able to suggest why you might not want to use these on tarmac or or roads? Does anyone have an idea why you may not want to use one in that sort of situation? Okay, so these will rip up roads. The the tracks are metal. Uh, there's a lot of uh, weight going through them. They will just eat roads. Um, they will just rip the tarmac up because to turn they turn like tanks. And if you know how a tank turns, is you you stop this this track from uh, from moving and then you spin this one. So this just drags itself over tarmac. So in areas where you want to protect. Um, the surface of the uh, surfaces. These aren't ideal. You'll have to put mats down in order to kind of protect whatever is underneath it. Um, this was a port that we were working in for this one where I took this photo. Um, and if you, you ever go to a, uh, like a port, a container port, this was in um, Liverpool, you'll know that the tarmac there is like ravaged anyway. So protection of the of the surface wasn't actually necessary for this one it, but it did do some quite hefty damage in some areas um, but luckily um, it wasn't really um, an issue with this particular project moving on we've got self erecting mobile tower cranes it's a bit of a mouthful but or self erectors if you want to be a little bit more concise these are basically um, mobile cranes, but they the boom is vertical and then they have a horizontal jib on the top. So they're basically a tower crane on a mobile crane's chassis. So first point, tower crane, they can drive in public roads. They are incredibly fast to erect. Uh, they only take about 15 minutes. You only need a one, one driver to support it. It's what they call a taxi crane, which basically means that, that um, a taxi crane is a crane that can drive to site, arrive to site. It doesn't need any other supporting vehicles. It can uh, erect itself, it can mobilize itself, and then it only needs its driver, and then it will do all its work, and then demobilize itself without the need for any supporting vehicles, and then leave site, and then go to the next job. Um, it's basically, um, it's able to do everything it needs to do on its own. It doesn't need any support. Which, which is why uh, it's called a taxi crane. Uh, these are best suited in areas where your reach is more important than your capacity. So if you're working with lots of small, uh, low weight loads, these are ideal, especially if you need to lift over a building, for example. These are very, very, very much suited for that sort of work. They are height adjustable, so the jib itself can be put slightly low or slightly higher as needed. Um, that The extent of that is dependent on the particular model of the self-erector, but that, then most of them are able to do that. And they have quite limited range, so like I said, it's more for when you need reach rather than capacity. They can get up to 18 tonnes, but that's when the trolley on the jib is right against the mast rather than out here. Out here you'll only get about one, one and a half tons or in most situations. Again, capacity is depending on the particular model of the crane. Moving on, we've got lattice boom truck cranes. So these are, these are basically and usually do have a crawler crane equivalent to them. So some crawler cranes will have an alternative model where instead of having a crawler base they'll have a wheeled base like this 
Sarens has, I believe, the largest truck crane in the UK. We have the Gotwald 8K680, I believe it was built in like the 1970s, 1980s. It's quite an old crane at this point, but it's still one of one of the workhorses of the fleet. Um, essentially, what we will drive to site is just the slewing ring and the partial superstructure of it. Everything else will come on supporting trucks, so the boom, the counterweight, the derrick mast, which is this bit that back here. So all of this will be individual. Even if you look carefully, even the outriggers will come uh, separately to this crane. So this, these are very much suited for when you need the capacity of a crawler crane, but you don't, you don't need it to. You just need that capacity for one or two lifts from the same spot. You don't need to move. You just need to pick up something very heavy and put it somewhere else. Whereas a crawler crane would be better if you need to pick it up, move it slightly, track a bit, go somewhere else, else on site from uh, maybe track back, do a little bit more mobilization on site rather than just pick up and move. So combines the mobility of all terrain cranes with the capacity range of crawler cranes. So they're quicker to mobilize to site and generally are quicker to uh, erect on site as well. Um, they have Comparable, but not completely similar uh, capacities to crawler cranes. So they have 130 to about 1,200 tons capacity. And th this is sort of um, some shots of the Gotwald in action. So here we have it rigged. So when you rig a, a lattice boom, it has to be flat. So this is one of the considerations you need to be uh, need to have in the mind. So when when you're rigging a crane like this, you need Say if it's got a 60 meter boom, you need 60 meters of clear space on the ground to be able to rig that boom. So the use cases of these sorts of cranes are more limited than, um, say, hydraulic cranes, which don't need uh, that much room to rig, uh, depending on their configuration. Telescopic truck mounts. These are basically designed to be taxi cranes. These are designed to drive from the depot, drive to a site, set up, do the five or six lifts they're, they're hired to do, and then drive to the next site, do the five, six lifts they need to do there, drive to the next site, and then at the end of the day, come back to, um, or back at the end of the week, or however long they're on, they're on the road, to come back to the depot. They are completely independent of, of any support vehicles. They've got all the, uh, all the necessary equipment they need on board. And because they're on a conventional truck, uh, truck, truck chassis, they can do normal um, motorway speeds or truck speeds, um, 60 miles an hour as needed. They're efficient, they're fast, they're designed for frequent or long uh, distance travel, but they have much limited, much more limited capacity ranges. So topping out around 80 ton uh, capacity. Moving into rough terrain cranes, the, the popularity of rough terrain cranes has a certain um, correlation to the price of oil <laughs> to an extent, because they're quite popular in Arab Emirates states for supporting um, uh, oil uh, refineries, as well as uh, gas and mining, I believe is another point they're used. They're quite common in America because they they tend to have uh, a different sort of makeup of the individual cranes that are available on site or, or in the room uh, or that are available. You'll notice that what crane is popular where is kind of dependent on where they are geographically. The UK is very much into all terrain cranes um, on that support most of their sites. A lot of the time in America, are quite a lot of rough terrain cranes support a lot of the sites. Um, it's that kind of geographical difference. I'm not entirely sure why that difference exists, but um, if you ever do any international work, you'll probably recognize that the types of cranes you're interacting with will change depending on where you are in the world. Rough terrain cranes in particular, they're designed for really rough conditions. They've got big tires, they're four wheel drive, they're all uh, all wheel steering a lot of the time. 
they're compact, they're versatile, they've got excellent gradeability, which basically means they're able to uh, deal with much larger slopes than normal crane will, so they can uh, climb hills that maybe not necessarily other cranes would be able to. They are able to drive with suspended loads, but that's at a much lower capacity um, than uh, they're, what they're rated for because of additional dynamic loadings of inherent in moving loads suspended. They have capacity ranges from about 12 to 150 tons. And we move on to the final uh, type of crane. These are quite rare, to be fair. They, um, you might come across quite very small um, versions of these cranes uh, on site, but typically you will only really interact with pick and carries if you op are operating in like an industrial setting. So these are designed to be able to pick up and carry a load, as their name kind of suggests. They can move with a suspended load. They are work ready all the time. They can, they don't need uh, outriggers, but they typically can only lift over the front. They don't have 360 um, rotation of the boom that other cranes will have. Yeah, they move, they're usually used in industrial context and their capacities range from about five to 40 tons. Um, Sarings has a few of them, but we have a sister company called Somoco, which is more of an industrial um, uh, industrial supporting com uh, company that we, if we have any kind of um, lift uh, pick and carries, they're usually run by Somoco. I believe this one is also a Somoco, it's just Saring branded. Um, right. So moving on to uh, crane configurations. So cranes are quite complicated pieces of equipment. You can have different types of cranes, but within those cranes, you also have different configurations of those individual cranes. So cranes can utilize a variety of different components in order to modify the abilities of the crane. So you can have components that in extend the reach of the crane. You can have components that increase the capacity of the crane. You can have uh, modifications that minimize the footprint of the crane or maximize the footprint of the crane as needed for stability. Uh, the combinations of these components are referred to as the crane's configurations, and these different configurations will be defined by the manufacturer. And there were states like um, they will state each individual configuration and the capacities related to that particular configuration. So the following slides will give you an idea of the typical configurations available to all terrain cranes. These are pretty well applicable to a lot of different types of cranes, but it's easier to show you on an all-terrain crane because these are most likely what you'll be interacting with once you get on site. So we have an all-terrain crane here in plan and section. Uh, the sections at the top, plan at the bottom. So we have four outriggers. Uh, these are what provide the stability for the crane. Uh, these also lift the rest of the crane up off of the ground. So all the loads from the crane itself and the load it's lifting will be imparted into these four points. Um, we then have the superstructure, which in, in, is this section up here, which involves the counterweight at the back, which is basically the balancing uh, weight that provides uh, stability against the load you're lifting. You've got the undercarrier, which is the part of the crane, which has got basically the wheels. It's got the slewing ring on, um, which allows the superstructure to rotate. and I don't know why I said and, that's about it for that. That's the main things you really need to know. So you've got the superstructure, which is the upper part of the crane, the undercarrier, which is the lower part of the crane. You've got the outriggers, and then you've got the counterweight. And you've also got the operator's cab here as well. But, and you've got the driving cab at the front. So the standard configuration for a mobile crane 
is main boom only. So this is when a uh, crane arrives to site. It's got some got some counterweight on the back, but it's only using its main boom. It's got a head sheave at the top, which is where um, you'll have a you'll have a how oh, I remember the word. You'll have a, a wire drum at the back here that will run a wire up to the top here, and then the sheave up here. You'll run the wire basically repeatedly through here to increase the amount of uh, falls of the rope, and it basically just provides the capacity you need in that particular rope. Uh, you've got a hook block, which is what you what you connect to the load or connect to your rigging of the load. And then you've got your luffing cylinder here, which raises and lowers the boom as needed. This is, as, as I mentioned, it's the standard operating uh, configuration for mobile cranes. Um, this is what you'll probably come across most of the time. Uh, a crane that will just rock up to site, stick its boom out and do its lifting. Simple as. Simple as the crane can be. It's quick mobilization and it, does, and it will only need additional counterweight if it's over the standard traveling. So basically, there is a certain amount of counterweight that a crane can travel with that is allowable. Anything over that amount, um, you will require additional trucks to bring that in, and then it can be rigged up with that additional counterweight on site for the lifts, and then that counterweight needs to be removed after the lifts, put on the trucks, and then it will leave with its traveling counterweight at the end of it. So for example, there's a uh, a 60 ton, no, 100 ton DMAG all terrain crane has a traveling counterweight of about 25 tons. So it can travel with 25 tons of counterweight. But if you want capacity, increased capacities, you have to add additional counterweight. So that, that needs to be added on site and then removed before it can travel anywhere else. Um, moving up. We've got basically adding a wire guy or a backstay to the boom. This basically decreases the boom deflection of uh, the crane's boom, increasing the available capacities. Um, it's very similar to the standard configuration of main boom only. Um, it really only affects uh, the rigging time in a minor uh, way, approximately about 45 minutes, sometimes an hour. It depends on the crane particularly, but this will greatly increase the amount of capacity that this particular crane um, can lift at. And all it does is simply just take deflection out of the main boom um, and basically provides a more rigid base for and provides more support for the boom. We then have a fixed fly, which is a set of lattice sections that be, can be added to the head of the main boom. This basically sacrifices capa uh, capacity for additional reach. We call it a fixed fly because it will be fixed at a certain angle. So typically angles are in uh, usually around 0, 20 and 40 degrees. However, they can vary slightly from that depending on um, manufacturer and model details. But the typical angles are zero, which is basically if it's zero, it's straight with the boom. If it's 20 degrees, it'll be slightly off with the boom. And then if it's 40 degrees, it'll almost be uh, flat if you have a boom like this. Um, the jib angle is set at the beginning of the operation and it can't be changed when the crane is lifting a load. It's set at that much. Um, some uh, if between loads, you can change the angle of the boom, but um, you don't um, really want to be doing that. If you can do it with one, one angle, that's kind of what you want to try and do. It does have increased rigging time because these individual lattice sections need to be lifted on to the crane. They might require a support crane. In some situations and some crane models, the fixed fly can be kind of installed on the boom 
um, on the side of the main boom at the depot and then it can travel to site with it on the side of the main boom and then it can like fold it out by itself however that's very usually that very much is dependent on the crane itself and it's usually for uh mid-sized cranes so anything between the 50 and 100 ton um kind of uh capacity range larger cranes um can't really do this because the the sections of the fixed fly are much more uh, robust and therefore heavier so there is the potential for additional supporting cranes in order to install this jib uh, additionally you can do you can combine the fixed fly with a backstay so it provides additional reach and it enables higher capacities um, again it has the same issues where you can't change the jib, uh, jib angle under load and compared to the original rigging time for fixed flies, um, it's only a minor increase. Then we have the main boom with luffing jib. So this provides additional uh, reach while maintaining high capacities. This is this can be changed under load. So essentially in this, this arrangement, the main boom is set at an angle and that won't change. So for example, it's set at 66, 76 or 84 degrees as necessary. And then all the movement of the boom is done in the luffing jib. So this will stay put, and then this will be rotate or luffing up and down to change the radius that the crane's working at. These have the potential to greatly increase reach and potentially capacities, depending on what radius you're working at. And but they much more intensive to install. They require significantly large rigging areas to be able to uh, to be able to rig and they definitely require a sport crane in order to install all the components that are required. The the rule of thumb for how much rigging space you need for a crane like this would be the minimum length of the main boom of the crane that's the uh, that's cranes being used and then plus the length of your proposed luffing jib. For example, if you've got a minimum boom length of 20 meters that will be horizontal for uh, rigging the luffing jib and then say if the luffing jib's 80 meters long it will be that main boom so 15 meters or i did a 15 meters or 20 meters plus the 80 100 meters you'll need 100 meters of uh, 100 meters minimum of rigging area for that component so when I used to work with another contractor, um, I used these quite a lot into uh, for the erection and dismantle of tower cranes in London. And uh, one of the main factors when planning an operation was if there was enough room on site or on local roads, it'd be able to close enough of the road to be able to rig this sort of configuration. And sometimes there was, sometimes there wasn't, sometimes you um it was quite a major planning factor in those operations again simply you can add a y guy and then you can um uh, dramatically increase the capacity of these cranes so you can see how over from the really simple main boom the complexity of configurations can dramatically increase that wasn't an exhaustive list of configurations, but kind of covered the main ones. Uh, lattice boom, crawler cranes and truck cranes can have um, things called super lift trays and derrick masts. I think that that there is a derrick mast. It's basically uh, another mast of the crane that provides support for the main boom. And then back here, you can see some counterweight trays, which is the super lift. Um, but they're less common to come across in typical construction projects, so I wouldn't worry too much about them about them at this stage. Uh, rough truck and telescopic crawlers are have less options. Self erecting tower cranes can only technically technically vary the outrigger centers and jib height and the jib angle. So the amount of options you have per crane is kind of dependent on what type of crane it is, but for all terrains, which is your most common that you'll come across, um, 
the, the, the previous slides are pretty much what you'll be coming across most of the time. Um, also, with those additional ones, you can vary counterweight and outrigger whips um, within those addition, those uh, configurations to further affect um, uh, capacities. Um, but bear in mind, the more you add to a crane, the more trucks you need to support it to bring the components to site. Um, where you're going to store those on site, where they, where what well, the access routes. So the bigger co the configuration, the more components you're adding to the base crane, the much more complex your planning becomes in terms of getting things to site, getting things on site, and then getting things off of site. Does anyone have any questions before I move on to the last section of this presentation for this uh, this lesson? So. This is the heavy lift fun uh, planning functional model. It was um, produced by a guy called Hornaday in the 1993. It is primarily used for um, module lifts on oil refineries, but it's a good uh, model to kind of understand the factors and the constraints that affect uh, mobile crane planning. So, for example, the the main stage of this is the heavy lift planning stage. So we have three stages within heavy lift planning. We have feasible cranes and partial lift plan, which is the preliminary planning. So we get a preliminary idea of what crane we uh, would we want, what size of crane, where does it need to be? where uh, what's the site like and then from the preliminary you then optimize it into a detailed optimization plan which defines the feasible cranes and the optimum lift plan so you just basically from the first one to the second one it's just a series of optimizations um, and then the final bit of optimization brings it into a final optimum crane size and lift plan and final evaluation and selection so there's three kind of stages to it Throughout those, you're always considering the planning factor of cost and reliability in terms of the crane. So how much do you have to spend on the crane? What higher rates can you accommodate? Um, how reliable is the crane and the supplier that's supplying the crane? Can you trust them? Can you do you know that their, their equipment's good? That sort of stuff. So the in uh, to going into heavy lift planning, you have the inputs, you have the crane, the load and the size. I will explain these a little bit more in detail uh, in the following slides. Then you have the controls, which are the spatial constraints, the, constra the structural uh, constraints and the schedule constraints. And then you have the mechanisms, which are the constructor, the owner the and the engineering consultant. And then from that, all of as the inputs, the controls and the mechanisms are uh, digested in the in the in the model in in the process of heavy lift planning, you have you then develop the outputs, which is crane location, uh, load pickup position, the load lift path, the tailing crane location if required. And, and a number of other options. Again, the this particular model is more uh, is aimed at um, oil and gas operations, but it's a good, still a good scheme um, to think of when you're kind of um, uh, planning an operation. It gives you a good um, uh, idea of how everything interacts. So inputs, these relate to the physical aspects of the operation. So these can be the crane data, the, the load data and the site details. So how big is the crane? What is the capacity of the crane? Uh, what is the crane? Um, the, then the load data is the stuff like how big is the load? How heavy is the load? Um, what is uh, where can I pick up the load? Where are the, the lifting points? And these are usually defined by the manufacturer shop drawings. So say if you get a, an idea. Um, an idea for say. Uh, uh, an air conditioning system. If you've got a big 
um, air system on the roof that needs to be installed. The manufacturer will define the lift points where it's safe to connect rigging to in order to lift the off the thing. They'll give you the weight. They'll get the, give you the dimensions. And that and they'll give you everything you need to do for that. And then you have the site details. So what is the site? Where is the site? What is on the site? What's the ground conditions like? That sort of stuff. And then, so again, crane data, physical dimensions, crane capacities, cost, availability, reliability, service record. If the, for example, is the crane available? Is it reliable? Has it been serviced? Like, is it up to snuff? Basically, is it? it has it been checked? Is it legal? It's definitely a check that needs to be done. Ninety-nine percent of the time, you won't have an issue with that, but need, still needs to be checked each time. Load data. So, what are the dimensions and shape? What is the weight? Where is the center of gravity? Is it? directly underneath the lifting points or is it offset slightly? Do you need to consider that in the rigging? Um, and then also the load of fabrication and delivery schedule, like when's it getting delivered to site? When's it available? When's it being fabricated? These not necessarily going to affect the lift plan itself, but they establish the work window when when you need to be on site and that then would feed back into the availability of the particular crane you want as well. And then you have the site data. So you have the spatial layout and the dimensions. How big is the area? What is in the area? Uh, the ground conditions. Uh, what, what is the crane sit on? Uh, what are the allowable pressures that the correct ground can withstand? Um, and then what is what when the crane is there, what changes to the site are going to happen? Like, Will the permanent structure be uh, continue to be developed? Um, will the height of the building when the crane arrives be less than when the crane leaves? Will will there be mobile structures around it? Will scaffolds be built? Will um, other cranes come in? Will force work or form work be put up that might affect the crane crane's position? So it's all these different uh, factors you need to consider when citing a crane is like if I put that there on the 1st of July is it still going to be in the right position on the 15th of July or is it or, or will it be an issue where it's sitting will it get in the way so that's a consideration that needs to be to be thought of so the controls so basically the inputs are the stuff that gets inputted. So I, I, uh, you get the site conditions, you define the site conditions, uh, you get given the crane data, and then the controls are relating to the aspects of the operation that can, that constrain the planning scope and dictates how the operation can be undertaken. So from the input of the, uh, from the site, uh, the site layout, you get the spatial constraints. You are defining the space for the operation. The structural constraints. What is this, what what is the strength of the crane? What is the size of the is strength of the site? What is the strength of the load? And then you have the schedule constraints, which is uh, which is what when the project needs to be done by, and the variances the variance of the spatial and structural constraints as you go through the schedule. Um, you'll see there is quite a bit of overlap between the inputs and controls. So basically, inputs is the base information you get. So it, uh, basically, it's the data um, that you get, and then you turn it into information when you compare it to itself in its in a way to define your constraints. So spatial constraints, what is the volume of work that's happening in that area? Um, what is the access and egress from the site? Like if you say, I, I can fit a 200 ton crane in this area, but then you actually come to it, you're like, oh, I can't actually get it in the site gate. Like that is a spatial constraint. Uh, space for a crane, if the crane you defined, is there even enough room in the space you want it for it to operate and not hit anything? Um, the space for the load. So when you pick the load up, what is the path of the load that it's going to take? Can you actually lift it over everything that needs to be lifted over? And then pinch points. So when I just say pinch point, 
we basically mean like say if i'm lifting over the corner of this building my pinch point is this extreme edge of the building to this edge of the boom so i can only go as close to uh this point if i'm lifting over over so that's a pinch point so that's the worst case um clearance so but i need to be able to accommodate the boom deflection settlement in the crane itself and the potential for on on-site inaccuracies um cranes are quite big pieces of equipment i can in autocad i can define a crane's uh position to the millimeter but inside on site it's not going to be that it's it's going to be within 250 mil or something like that um i'm going to start speeding up because i know i'm heading towards the end of my time so then structural constraints determining the required strength of the crane the site the load what is the load's ability to accommodate the forces imparted to it by the lifting operation itself the client is kind of responsible for that the, cl uh, the client should calculate and define the allowable bearing pressures in the ground they should um uh they should advise whether or not uh, what the particular lifting arrangement needs to be for the load, depending on how strong the load is or when where the load is to be lifted. Um, schedule constraints. These become a lot more powerful as the operation date comes closer. So other construction operations may be taking place at the same time. Structures may be constructed as the crane is there, so it may add constraints to the operation as the crane stays on site. There may be a constraint at the end of the project that there wasn't at the beginning of the project. And then what critical activities need to be undertaken before the crane can even arrive there. If, for example, if they haven't prepared the ground before the crane gets there, the operation can't take place because the ground isn't suitable for the operation. And then mechanisms. These are factors that bring the plan into existence. So. Uh, so the people involved so constructor provides information about the site and the load to the lift planner the engineering consultants provides the information as per their role so if they're ground uh, if they're geotechnical engineers they'll provide the geotechnical information and then the owner of the project or the construction manager i guess the like the final ownership of the project information and therefore ensure sufficient information has been provided to the lift planner to be able to lift uh, to be able to develop the plan that they need to be and be, develop it in a manner that is correct and is um, accurate to the site. The final execution of the plan is responsibility. So the lift planner, but the owner is should help um, the lift planner ensure that the data that they have is correct and complete. And outputs and the outputs are just the in, uh, is the interaction of inputs, controls, and mechanisms. These they're just the final, there as what it was described, is the output. They can change, uh, outputs are not stationary. If you change the inputs, if you change the control, or if you change a mechanism, the output will change. Um, and they can exist in three forms. So you have the preliminary, the detailed, and the final. So basically, uh, napkin sketch to final plan. It's essentially it. And these outputs will take a uh, form of either a single or a series of technical drawings, as well as all associated risk and method statements. And those are uh, living documents. So if uh, a, a control changes during the, the planning of the operation, these documents need to be updated to, re uh, to recognize that change. And then finally, a heavy lift functional uh, heavy lift functional model. This is a simple model to understand the interaction of factors in lift planning. Um, again, it was developed in an industrial setting in oil and gas, so all the outputs, particularly here, are may not be considered for every lift operation. Uh, there is overlap between the controls and inputs and mechanisms. Since they're not undertaken in isolation, they all affect each other. Uh, the interaction of these defines the operation and its feasibility as well as its optimum form. So we're moving into the planning of the operation itself, as in we've looked at the uh, looked at what controls operations, what the inputs are, but how do we? What are the steps to taking to actually planning the operation that's being undertaken? There are generally seven steps. So uh, there are uh, sorry, 
there are seven steps. So it's determine the load radius, determine the total load, determine the minimum hook height, which gives you a minimum boom length, define a proposed crane, calculate that crane's capacity to ensure it's acceptable, and then check out riggers against the ground bearing strength, and then you optimize that uh, pr uh, process. There is the possibility you come to calculating the capacity of the of the crane that you've uh, defined in step four. You may have to go back to four to define a new one if the capacity isn't much. So these two can kind you can kind of like circle around in this bit for a little bit, but that's fine. Uh, that's just the general uh, general way of working out. But those are the general four seven steps. So determine the load radius. What is the maximum radius you need to reach? Like what are you lifting to for example on this scheme the maximum load radius was 12 meters and this is defined by where the crane can be located in relation to the load it's be lifting so it's reliant on the available space on site it's reliant on what is currently on the site what plant is in the way what storage areas are on there are you allowed in the storage areas to use that space temporarily or are those storage areas always in use so you can't use that space do, does all of the area around your around where you're lifting have sufficient bearing capacities? Because not all ground is the same. Uh, not everything has the same strength. So there might be harder areas of the site or un, uh, more prepared areas of the site. Uh, there are voids and trenches because we always dig things in construction. There's foundations, there's all sorts of stuff. And then there's proximity to structures. Can you, is it safe to put a crane there? Are you gonna hit something with the, either the, back, uh, the tail of the crane or the boom itself. So the, all of those kind of feed into defining where the crane can be located in relation to the load. In a very simple operation, which is shown here, you can site the crane right next to the load. Um, for example, this one was literally just, uh, a, um, I'll just quickly show the laser pointer. In this one, it was very simple. A uh, truck would reverse out here, the load would be picked vertically up the truck would drive out and then the load will be vertically put down so the simplest operation you could come across for that one and then you need to determine the total load weight what is the load so the, this is essentially the net load which is the load of the item you're lifting so say 15 tons you then need to define what the tackle is or take an uh, an engineering judgment on what the weight of that tackle will be and then you need to add the hook block, like because the hook block is not considered in the capacities of the crane. It's considered part of the load because there are multiple uh, hook blocks that can be fitted on a crane. And you don't need to use the standard ones from the manufacturers. You can use the aftermarket ones uh, that are the equivalents. So they can't define what that weight will be. So it's up to you in order to um, determine it. Um, so basically everything underneath the head sheave, which is uh, identified last week in the in the uh, diagrams. So, it, but in simple terms, it's weight the weight of the load, weight of the tackle, and the weight of the hook lock, and that is your lift weight. You then need to define a hook height. So, the very simple way of doing this is taking your elevation, your clearance as that would be an estimate your load height your tackle height which may be also be an estimate depending on what stage of the operation you're currently at if it's preliminary you may just take a very rough approximation of how high you think or how much height will be in the rigging that's fine and then you need the chandelier height which is basically this figure here because the hook block on a crane cannot be um hoisted right up against the head sheave. There is always a need for a, a certain amount of wire rope between here and here for safety and so that you just don't drag the hook block into the head sheave and uh, shear the, uh, the hoisting ropes. This is usually defined in manufacturer's uh, specifications um, uh, next to the hook block or if again if needs be you can do a, a pretty preliminary guesstimate or estimate or of what that would be again depending on what stage of uh, planning you're in so if you're in preliminary planning it may be okay to take some estimates if you're in detailed stage planning 
you really need to be looking in at that detail and drawing it and defining it correctly. So in terms of this, the elevation, the difference between the level of the crane and the load, the clearance is an allowance for clearance obstructions. So if you're lifting onto a building, you want to uh, allow an extra two meters on top of the load height. So you have two meters between um, where you're putting down the load and the load itself. And then you have the chandelier height, which is what I've just described. This is a very, very rough approximation of the boom length requirement. Um, this will give you a height of uh, the load that you need to lift to as a maximum in relation to the crane position. So from this, you can kind of define what boom length or, or what kind of range of boom lengths you'll be looking at for the crane. And then with one to three uh, the points, you can define a preliminary crane. Uh, uh, the lift weight, the lift radius and anticipated hook height is the minimum information you need to define a crane. From here, with the helps of rough drawings, you can get an idea of the size of crane. You can also, a lot of calculators or online crane calculators and lift planning software like Lieber Crane Planner can also help with this. Um, they can, you can feed into that software these points of information and it can, can provide you a, 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 a guesstimate of to what cranes you're and what configurations you may be looking for. In the industry, that doesn't tend to be get used that much because by the time you've done a few lift plans, you've probably got some idea of looking at a lift and going, okay, it's going to be approximately this size. So you're always got a starting point. But this process for defining a crane is usually a bit of trial and error as you uh, as you go through the information and define different elements. And also the fact that information always changes on construction sites. So your position of the crane that you defined may or may not be still available when it comes to the operation. So this will then affect the crane that's available or may not affect the crane that's available. The, the updated information may still be fine for the proposed crane, but in other, way, in other ways it may not. So again, a trial and error process. But the crane choice isn't just defined by those things, mainly by those, but there may be alternatives as well. For example, you may look at one crane and say, this can do it, but it doesn't, we can't get it. It's not available. Therefore, we have to get a slightly bigger crane than what we want because of availability. So the main external factors are the availability, the cost, the reliability of the crane and the reputation of the company supplying the crane. These are always something you're going to be coming across in being a construction manager. You're always going to be looking at availability. You're going to be looking at cost and you're looking at reliability and you're going to be looking at reputation. You don't want to work with people who don't um, aren't reputable. You don't want to work with unreliable equipment, and you don't want to oversize uh, your equipment requirements uh, for the cost of the project. And if then you've got to work to availability, the construction company, uh, the construction industry has uh, uh, got a lot of um, movement in what is available one day may not be available the next. So those are the parameters you need to work in. Calculating the crane capacity. So the first place you go to is the crane capacity charts. These are supplied by mobile crane uh, manufacturers. Uh, if you're part of a company like I am with Sarans, we have access to the original manufacturer documents, which is easy to get at. Uh, if you're working from a preliminary standpoint from a con construction consultant, you may not, or a construction contractor, sorry, you may not have access to that information, but you have access to crane information, no matter what, through the manufacturer's websites, because they'll always provide what we call glossy brochures of the, the cranes available. When you're looking at uh, defining a crane and its capacity, your maximum utilization, which is basically the lift weight divided by your capacity minus any deductions times a thousand, so you just get a percentage out of that, um, shouldn't exceed 90%. So you shouldn't be using 90% of the capacity of the crane because you need a safety factor of some de some degree to allow for if the load is slightly heavier than what you anticipated, um, if it's a slightly larger radius than what you anticipated, you gotta allow for eventualities like that. So the glossy brochures, which are available on website on the website, um, 
of the crane manufacturers, they are uh, they don't provide a complete representation of a crane's capacity. Not always. The glossy brochure is good for preliminary state. So if you're looking at something and you want to say, I want to plan something around this particular lift, I need to lift this to this, and I need a boom length of this, and I need to know how big the crane is, I need to know what the size size of the crane is, just for a preliminary activity. These are fine. These will work for you. Um, they're a good first stop. I use them myself. But once you get into more detailed planning activities, their use, usability starts to dwindle a bit because they have one fundamental issue with them. They only consider the best case capacity at defined radii. Uh, however, because boom lengths are hydraulic, you can set them up with different hydraulic configurations. For example, this shows four different booms. They're all the same boom length, but the way that the hydraulics are set up on each different boom is slightly different. So here you have no, you have, you've retracted the first cylinder, but you've partially extended all the rest and you get 17.4 tons at seven meters, slightly different. You get 17.9 tons at seven meters. You have a slightly different one again, you get 20.9 and again, you get 22.4. These are all the same booms, they're all the same boom length and they're all the same radius, but because of the hydraulic setup on them, you get a slightly different capacity. But the only one that the glossy brochure will give you at that radius is the best case. So it will give you the 22.4 and it won't tell you about the fact that you can only get 17.4 down here. And the issue with that is every single figure in that will be slightly different boom configuration because the manufacturers want to show you the best that they that crane can do at a given radius um, so boom configurations are probably quite complex when you first look at them but when you start to understand them they're not too complex it's basically just a different extension for different things. For example, this one's not probably not got that much capacity at seven meters, but if you're lifting out further, it might actually have slightly higher capacities than one down here with a higher capacity further in. It's a trade off in that regard. But for probably what you're doing, the glossy brochures and crane planner will provide all the capacities you need to know to. So this will probably won't be too much of uh, an issue, but it's so, something that is useful to know just in case. Um, it's very cr common for cranes to be subject to deductions. So these can be either externally or internally. So externally, like an external factor or internally uh, something related to the crane itself. Neither the gl glossy brochures or the uh, manufacturer's literature, so the, the official capacity charts will include deductions in the capacities. The, they will be defined within um, those documents. Uh, and it would look something like this. This is from a Lieber document. So it's load reductions, load reductions with mounted TY block, which is uh, the super lift, sorry, the Y guy, as mentioned in the previous presentation. But the, if it's mounted on the boom, but it isn't used, you need to cons uh, assume a uh, capacity reduction. So Internal sources are lifting with a fixed fly stowed on the main boom and lifting with a TY frame stowed on the main boom. The, ax, the deductions will depend on the crane manufacturer and the crane model. But if you don't want to consider those uh, deductions, the components can be removed. But most hire companies try and avoid that if possible, because it's a bit of a faff to remove uh, components off of a crane in the yard uh, if they don't need to. So. They are willing to do it if absolutely needed to, but they tend to try and avoid it. External factors uh, are slightly different. They're, they're based on basically, uh, they can either be for operating in sensitive areas, i.e. if you're working on a nuclear site or areas where they just need higher safety factors. Um, if you're operating next to network rail assets, you will need to be uh, also being deductions for it because you're, they're very picky about what what kind of operations go on next to their high speed rail lines. And if your client requests it, your client may have a request for um, additional safety factors generally on the site for some reason or another. Commonly, the deduction is 25% of the capacity. That is the pretty standard uh, request for deduction 
uh, deductions. It's usually around that. It's very rare if it's anything beyond 25%. And then we've got to check out rigor loads at the end of it. So we're lifting a load. We're got, uh, we've got a crane set up. We're lifting a load. The load from the crane and the load needs to go somewhere. So it goes into the ground through the outriggers. So the crane will impart that load into the ground through the outriggers and the load is dictated by how much you're um, lifting, what radius you're lifting and the configuration of the crane. So once you define an outrigger load, which can be done either through this software, which is called Lycon, uh, but you won't need to worry about that. Uh, I will show you in the lab session how to calculate the uh, uh, the crane loads or the outrigger loads through Crane Planner, and it's quite simple and it's quite intuitive. It does it all for you, so I won't, don't worry too much about that. Um, basically, the it essentially just means that if you are putting load into the ground, it needs to be checked. You need to check that the load being put into the ground is acceptable and the ground is going to be strong enough in order to be able to uh, take that load. Once everything of that is defined, you've got a crane, you've got a load, you've got a position, you know where you're picking it up from, you know where you're putting it down. You have to go back through the operation because information changes. You can relook at it, you can like rationalize some stuff. You may be able to uh, move the crane slightly in order to slightly uh, reduce counterweight usage or you may be able to, uh, another crane comes available that is slightly smaller and can still do the job. So there's a certain amount of rationalization that you can do after you've done your preliminary. So can you make the crane smaller? What risks are currently inherent in the project, which can be mitigated by slightly tweaking the crane plan? Um, and it's just, <sighs> crane plans are living and breathing things. They, uh, the construction sites are very dynamic, so they will change that it's very rare that you'll start and do a preliminary scheme and the preliminary scheme is exactly the same as the detailed scheme. There's always changes between. So what are the consequences of doing a bad job of planning? There are two main modes of failure. There's structural failure and there's stability failure. Uh, and these can be affected by a number of different options uh, or uh, uh, not options, sorry decisions but the most common thing that you can find is the crane accident will be linked to insufficient or incorrect planning so stability or structural failure can be done by exceeding the crane's capacities it could be if you pull or drag a load you can over uh, the friction the the additional force of friction and if you're pulling um uh perpendicular to the boom it can cause a failure um, if you're swinging the load uh, unnecessarily, that can also cause a, because it can swing out to a further radius or it can swing to the side and uh, and do a lateral force of the boom. And then that can cause a failure as well. Wind has the same effect if it's uh, excessive wind. And if you're lifting submerged loads, avoid that at all costs because you can never guess how heavy that load will be with the addition of water because it will get into everywhere. It will always be a different weight which is, I believe, what happened here. They were lifting something out of the water. They were, it was high, uh, heavier than they anticipated, and the boom failed uh, quite catastrophically. Failure can also be a, a result of poor maintenance, but that tends to be more rarer and much bigger news when it happens. Uh, you can fail due to ground conditions. If you punch a hole in the ground, that's not the greatest thing to do in the world. Uh, if you're insufficient distance from trenches or underlying voids, you might uh, cause a rotational collapse of the ground into those. The, the side of a trench might collapse if there's too much load going into it laterally. If the ground isn't just firm enough. For example, here, the uh, tarmac was assumed to be okay and it just punched through. There was also, this is a photo I just got off the, off the, off the internet, if I'm honest, but it's quite good because it shows um, probably not enough matting and probably not enough investigation into the ground. You can fail by clashing into things. So, for example, if you if the counterweight is swinging around and it hits something behind it, uh, if you clash into something by if you're putting an outrigger out and there's something in the way and it hits it for some reason, um, or if you are uh, lifting a load and you you hit the load into something, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be an accident 
to be a failure planning. You can, there's other outcomes, for example, you might not be able to get the crane on site if you haven't checked the access route. You, uh, the crane might get to its position and then find there's a lamppost in the way that just is right on where the crane needs to be positioned. Uh, if you become jib bound, for example, that you don't pl plan clearances correctly, you bluff, you boom out uh, and you find that you can't uh, uh, reach what you want to reach without the crane clashing into a leading edge. Or if the crane just becomes available, if you're dragging your feet and you want a crane, you drag your feet and then the crane becomes unavailable, that's also a failure of planning. So here's some examples of some poor planning. They're quite uh, uh, quite excessive um, issues, but they kind of show what I'm trying to describe. This one was in uh, New Zealand. It, co it occurred in 2010. Uh, there's a, it was a 10 ton, sorry, a hundred ton class all terrain. It was placing 22 ton concrete beams. It was building a cycleway bridge over a river. The, crane, the cranes were located. There was actually two cranes. There was one on this side and one on the other. Only one of them failed. Uh, but the cranes were located on a shore of a creek, which you can see here, which was improved by basically piling on top of it compacted gravel fill everything that was done was done to industry standard uh, the overhead lines were shut off critical lift planning was undertaken and all the site movements were planned it was planned it was on the face of it safe they undertook a counterweight check which basically means they rotate the the upper ca uh, carrier of the crane through 360 degrees and they monitor any subsidence in the outriggers none was uh, noticed but while they were lifting the final beam, I, sorry, the second beam, there a crack uh, kind of uh, formed underneath one of the outriggers and a rotational failure of the ground occurred, which basically means the, uh, the ground underneath just ba it basically rolled away from the crane. Um, this was generally uh, found to be a failure of a ground uh, investigation because the contractor thought they understood the ground they didn't there was actually quite a lot of um, marine mud underneath the platform that they didn't realize was there that failed because it had quite a low bearing pressure and they actually made this incident possible and probably worse because of the addition of the rock, rock platform the weight of that actually exacerbated uh, the accident no one was killed in this accident. There was minor injuries. Um, there is quite a good uh, documentary video put out by the contractor about this incident. Um, it seems it, it's quite good to go through. They describe exactly what's going on and how to mitigate it next time. Um, I'll make sure there is a um, there a link available to Robbie that will uh, put up somewhere for that. Much more bigger one. Some of you may have seen this. This would did go around on uh, trending on YouTube. Uh, well, 2015, 2016, something like that. Uh, yeah, 2015. Sorry, this was in Alfa an der Rhein uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, 2015. There was two cranes, one smaller than one bigger, and they were lifting this uh, bridge section into it. They were both located on barges. There's a barge here. There's a barge back here. There's actually a barge down here as well, which this frame is sitting on. So both the cranes were less than on barges. They're picking up from a third barge. The operation called for the cranes to pick the, uh, the bridge section up, sail it, and then once the uh, once the um, load was uh, picked up by the cranes, it would then be sailed 100 meters down uh, the Rhine to the installation position. It's quite a big failure. The barge with the smaller uh, uh, crane on it demonstrated significant instability as soon as the load was picked up. The load swung towards the crane. It laterally loaded the boom. The boom failed, and the small crane toppled off of this barge into the uh, the Rhine. There, unfortunately, as the crane was doing a tandem lift, it, the this crane was attached to the load, which in turn was attached to this crane. So this one, this uh, the small crane falling over dragged the big one down with it. The load, which is this bridge, landed on a row of houses and a cafe. Luckily, no one was uh, fatally injured. Uh, there was a number of injuries, but 
luckily nothing serious throughout this for a uh, a main point that was in the accident report for this particular issue is the complexity of the project was not understood they were underestimated by the hire crane the crane hire company and the barge supplier they had worked together before they had done similar operations they uh, thought they understood everything that was going on and they just didn't do the planning necessary and the contractor didn't check their work this it failed catastrophically and did immense damage to the uh, to to the surrounding area they the cranes were too high in rid in in relation to the width of the barges there were heavy items placed on the barges as well as the cranes that affected stability that weren't considered at all in the plan and the cranes were working at almost 100 percent of the capacity they had no additional um safety factor for any of the loads being lifted and one of the things that came out in the thing uh, of the accident report it was doomed to fail from the design stage like there was there was no way that this operation was going to go uh, going to be successful that it was just an inevitability that this accident would happen and no one picked up on it because no one did the proper planning so don't do that okay so you've defined all all of what you need to do you've done all your planning you need to now communicate this to people how do you do this you do this through a lift plan and these are a document or a series of documents depending on what uh, on what uh, the complexity of the operation so this document will collate all the information about the proposed lift it will collate everything it will be maybe a single document maybe a series of drawings it is essentially a simulation of the proposed lift in a static form so you will identify areas of concern and risk from this you'll understand constraints through this um, you'll understand the scale of your equipment in relation to the site it is a communication of this information visually to everyone that needs to know about it it will be provided to the client and the operational teams will use this as well it is a living document this will change from the preliminary to the detailed even on site sometimes these teams may change because stuff changes for example on i will go into this doc, uh, this particular operation uh at the end in a little case study um and that changes it changes quite a lot and it even changed on site because of some uh, information that came up so what information do does a lift planner need to lift a, uh, for a lift plan well you need information about the site you need sections and elevations of any obstructions or surrounding structures or at least estimates of the height you need the local ground uh, levels you need underlying services you need street furniture basically anything the crane can interact with you need to know where they are uh you need to know if there's any access or egress route restrictions that may limit the size of the crane you need to definitely need need to know the weight of the load and the dimensions of the load what are the lifting points on the load? Can you sling it normally or is there special slinging requirements? What are location of site obstructions? So what, again, like going back to the storage areas, the trenches, scaffolding is one big thing because no one, very few people seem to, to keep track of where scaffolding is. A, uh, scaffolding is a highly mobile structure on a construction site. It will walk across a site as need, needed as it's replaced in different areas to work on different bits of the project. And that can sometimes be not picked up on. And when you come to the operation, you find that either there's some scaffolding where you want to put the train or you're lifting over scaffolding that you didn't know was going to be there. And you may have issues with clearance, which has happened a few times in my career. So you need to know the pickup and lay down positions where you're picking it up. Is it coming off a truck? Can the truck get next to the crane or is there only specific places that the truck can be positioned? So are you lifting? Uh, is your pickup point a further lift than your laydown point? There's always these sorts of questions. And then what are your available resources on site? Can you reuse stuff that's already on the site to benefit your crane plan? Is there already like uh, wooden matting that you can use to spread your bearing pressures and stuff like that? These items highlighted are preferably usable in CAD format because they will be incredibly useful and it's much easier to digest information if it's visually and it's uh, communicable through this sort of format, because that's every, that's all we work in is we work in uh, engineering drawings. So if we can get that information in a drawing format, perfect. We can 
we can work through that super quick. So that's the information you need to produce a lift plan. What is it that a lift plan actually needs to show? So it needs to define the crane and in the model, I imagine manufacturer of that crane. You need to have the crane configuration, like how is the crane set up? You need the lift weight, you need to uh, define if there's any deductions considered. You need to define what the radius you are lifting are. are. You need to uh, define what the capacities are and therefore the capacity uh, utilization. So what is the capacity in relation to the, the weight of the stuff you're lifting? The hook block type, um, because that will affect your lift weight. If it's, uh, if it's rated to lift 100 tons, it's going to be a heavier hook block than something that's rated to uh, lift 25 tons. So that needs to be defined. And also the site team would need to know what uh, what it is because they will need to make sure that hook lock goes on the support trucks to go with it because there will only be one hook block that naturally travels with the crane and that will usually be quite a small one. Crane mat re uh, requirements. So what cranes mats need to be supplied in order to uh, minimize your ground pressures? What are the actual outrigger loads that you need to mit uh, mitigate? You need a plan and section because you, do, you need to be able to show what the operation is actually doing. And then you need to define any relevant warnings and risks identified during the operation. So this is a scheme that I did quite a while ago. 2019, yes, there was a couple of snippets of this in previous slides, so you might recognize some of it. So this was quite a simple operation. Pick up from the lorry, place down directly um there was it was simple as did a site visit did some di uh, dimensions made sure nothing was there highlighted on site that there was a lamp post here and that we needed to be uh warn it uh, needed to be careful of it it wasn't going to be a major issue during the, uh, the operation but it just needed to be something that monitored just to make sure we didn't clash into it or get a bit too close operation went fine no issues um everything was monitored so it was a fine one but this is a good, as it's quite a simple operation, it's quite a good um, uh, visualization of what needs to be in a lift plan. So we have outrigger loads here. We have the crane mat arrangement underneath. So we've defined what the crane mat here, is here. We've got a lift radius defined here and on plan. We've got what the hook block is and what the deductions are up here. We've got the lift weight defined here and the radius and the crane capacity at that radius and then the utilization so for example here you've got a 12 meter radius you've got a capacity of 19.2 tons and you've got a utilization of 88.6 percent based on uh, a total load of 17 tons so it's quite an easy calculation to do to work out uh, the utilization because it's just a percentage um, so nothing too complex there so you've got a crane configuration see it so we've got configuration T, which in this particular crane means that it's just main boom only. Uh, different manufacturers have different ways of ref, uh, of what they call configuration codes, which are basically shorthand for different configurations that crane can be um, uh, configured into. Um, you don't really need to know those unless you're working directly with mobile cranes every day. So as long as you know the difference between mobile a mobile crane main boom only or fly jib, you're fine. I wouldn't worry about trying to memorize those codes because you won't need to. So it defines the outrigger centers. So what's the distance between these? Because like laterally, these can change. Um, uh, longitudinally, they stay the same, but transversely, they can be altered to different uh, widths as required. You've got your counterweight, so how much counterweight you got on the back of this, so it's 17.2 tons. Then you've got the main boom length, which is 26 meters, which is 26 meters uh, from pivot point to head sheave. And then you've got the telescopic configuration under there, defining that it's uh, all the base sections are retracted and then all the uh, head sections are um, extended. Again, crane mat arrangement is on plan. Unoperational risk is defined here in terms of the lamppost. It's also highlighted again here. So, as you can see, quite a simple uh, lift plan of just picking up one item 
up vertically and then dropping it down vertically has can be quite complicated and has a lot of factors factors and a lot of things you need to consider this is a little case study we did quite this quite recently i say recently it was last year at this oh no it wasn't last year it was earlier this year actually this was one of the projects I did when I was in my uh, placement year, when I was doing my DIS, which I believe if your second years, you'll be doing next year. Um, so this is one of the uh, operations I was taken during that time. So the client was Leeds City Council. Uh, the main contractor was Balfour BT, and then the demolition contractor was S Evans and Sons. And we worked with S Evans and Sons. We, uh, we worked alongside uh, and an engineering consultants, and we were the crane and transport engineers um, for that. It was part of a 31 million upgrade project. Uh, it is basically the removal of this blue and red overpass. Uh, it was removing that and installation of a new modern replacement. Uh, the original bridge was no longer a, uh, like cost effective to maintain. There was too much damage to uh, the abutments, which is, uh, the, sorry, the columns here and the abutments at the end here. Um, they're also that part of, uh, Leeds was also in quite a big, uh, air time of renovation. Um, I actually, when I was working for McAlpines, there's a, a building down here that I helped do the crane, uh, tower crane planning for. Um, so it's quite a, quite a small world really. So Sarans was employed to provide the craneage and the SPMTs to remove the existing bridge sections. We're not going to go into the SPMTs or the self-propelled modular transports in this presentation. Um, that's a little bit, uh, that's very special equipment that we use. We're just going to concentrate on the, on the mobile cranes of this operation. So these central spans here were removed by the SPMT and the neighboring spans, which are the ones furthest down here and the ones that were behind the camera in this photo were removed by the mobile cranes. The demolition required four positions for the mobile cranes, two positions per phase. Um, so this was a this was the bridge that we were removing. So if I quickly if I draw all over this, so this was here where that was being moved by SBMT, and then these ones down here. Uh, these were removed by crane and this was removed by crane and they were taken out in individual um, um, uh, beams so there were beams running that way along here so and uh, the construction contractor would cut through the tarmac at the top to separate the beams underneath and then it would core down through either side of the beam so we can get our um, rigging through and then we'll just lift up. There are four crane positions, uh, two to the north and two to the south, but we're going to be talking about this particular position and this is where I'm going to try and get some interaction. So what on here do you think would affect the crane operation? Does anyone have a guess of anything on here that may affect the positioning of the crane. Go on. So, uh, someone give me something. I'm not surprised. I, 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 I it's not been long since I was a uni student either, to be fair. So, uh, uh, traffic lights. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So basically we've got, we've got street furniture, like we've got traffic lights. We've got this massive lamp pole, pole here. We've got the fact that it's a, a, it's an active road. So we need to close the road. Um, we've got service, uh, chambers here and here, and there's one here. Uh, we can see those, um, we've got curb lines up here. So there's a change in level. Um, there's bollards here. There's the, the, li the load we need to lift is here. And there's a, a there's a traffic light, and where are we going to put the crane? Do we do we say we need to take out all of this, or what? There's there's lots affecting this crane. There's also not it's not shown very well on this, but there's a slope on this road as well. This uh, goes up into a this higher 
uh, bridge section. So there's actually uh, quite a steady slope, not too bad down here, but it gets quite steep up here. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, there'll be a level difference over the length of the crane. So first plan we did was this one. I'm just checking the time. OK, you've got 10 minutes. So this is the first plan we had. This was preliminary plan. Uh, did it back in 2020 for concept only shows the position of the crane. As you can see, if we flick back here, the crane on this one is basically in this area here. So we're slightly on, this is actually Ho Hilton Hotel property up here. So that was on their land. Um, we had to have uh, timber mats underneath the wheels because we needed to raise the crane up to be able to get onto the matting because the matting was quite excessive on some of the areas because of the level difference between this point and this point. There was a traffic island we were trying to miss. There's a lot of the, the position of the, uh, of the beams was being put down here. And then we had to check the clearance to the bridge itself here. So, so there's multiple loads and then we have capacity utilizations, as I mentioned, usually a 10% uh, utilization in this project, we were actually working on 5% because we uh, actually, we, we rationalized that the weights we were using were actually the worst case weights. So if anything, they were going to go down when we lifted up because we were being very conservative with the weights of the beams, which ended up being quite actually true. We never got anywhere near 90% utilization. They were much, much lower than what the estimates of the weights were. So, um, so then we updated it. We got told we couldn't go on the Hilton Hotel property. That was a conversation between us and the contract uh, contractor. So the original plan was planned in preparation uh, with the contractor, assuming that we would be able to talk with the Hilton Hotel and it'd be acceptable. The contractor decided that wasn't going to be actually prudent to do, and they decided to avoid it. So we moved the crane down slightly. Um, same operation, slight different position. Uh, still with the issue with the with the levels over the crane. As you can see, this was done basically five months later. This was a scheme five months later, um, as you can see. And then this is another option that we did. This was, again, uh, another option. We moved further down. Uh, this was basically, I think, oh, three or four days before the operation even started. And we had to re rejig the crane, mainly because when we came to it, um, we got told that we couldn't put the crane where there is because this, the contractor had found uh, a service uh, tunnel underneath where we wanted to put the outriggers. And I've lost my mouse. So we got told that this exists and, they, and we were very much like, we cannot load that because we don't know what it can actually accept. But we also had to be careful because there was a culvert here, which had run underneath the road as well. So we needed to avoid that. So it kind of squished our crane position into this area here. Um, if I'm drawing too much, it'll get a bit complicated. So I'll just leave that. Um, but we also had to be aware of other services. So we couldn't affect this. We definitely couldn't affect this one. This, this was I highlighted as an extremely weak. Um, a service hole, so we had a uh, so we had to be well away from that. These we couldn't affect, but the, we with discussions from the contractor, all of the street furniture on this traffic island could be removed because it was getting replaced anyway. So, in terms of that, it was fine. But we also noted that now that we're right next to the the edge of the uh, edge of the uh, uh, the columns here. We had to be very careful with our the counterweight because as it slewed round, it had the potential to hit that uh, that uh, corner of the bridge. So we had to be very careful of that. So that was highlighted: slewing ring limiters. Uh, we had in loading positions of beams um, proposed lay down of another beam that was going to be stored on site. Um, so you can see through this how much a crane plan can change. And it may not seem like, oh, the crane moves slightly, but there's a lot of work that goes in each one of these plans because it's a lot of redrawing and it's a lot of replanning. Um, so as you can see, and even on site, this changed slightly. Um, I don't have that, don't have that drawing with on this thing, but the, there was a slight change on site. We en ended up changing the orientation of some of these um, 
bearing mats so this one rotated through this way because of of something in here so changes always happen uh construction sites are living breathe air breathing operations there will be changes you need to be considerate of that um right so you may be happy to know that that is the end of um uh this presentation